In today's class, we'll start looking at some RX architectures. So, if you remember, we looked at it very briefly in one class, uh, maybe a month and a half back. So, we'll look at it in a little more detail in today and tomorrow's class. Okay. So, the first one we'll look at will be the direct conversion. So, last class we looked at direct conversion and uh, um, uh, heterodyne TX architectures. So, we'll look at the same thing for RX. Okay, so let us see what it looks like. So, you have the antenna of course. So, you need a band pass filter to select the band. Then you have your LNA. Okay. Now, <clears throat> similar to last time, we will also have the same. Um, so, so far in the course, what we have been seeing is we have been looking at a very simple mixer, right? Even for receivers. But we saw last class that you can have modulation in both the I and the Q paths. So, you need to do the same thing for the receiver, just like we use the sine and a cosine okay, to uh, in, the, in the transmit path to up convert, we will have to do the same thing in the receiver because again you can have modulation in both the amplitude and the phase. Okay. Yes. Yes. You can get it from the amplitude and the phase of the signal, right? If you have, the, if you know the amplitude and the phase, you can have a cos theta and a sin theta, a cos phi of t and a sin phi of t. You give it. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Usually what happens is it is not, uh, computation does not happen that way. The uh, what is produced is actually the I and the Q components. If you need to convert it to uh, uh, f uh, um, amplitude and phase, you will send it through a, a circuit called a cardec. But uh, the I and Q are directly uh, this thing. I am not sure about how exactly they are produced in the baseband, that I am not sure. Okay. Um, I can get back to you on that. I can find out and get back to you. So, no, it's a single frequency signal. No, no. Both the XI of T and XQ of T are at the same frequency. Yes. Right? They just have different modulation. Well, they have independent modulation. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly. I was confused. Like, how do we generate the independent? Okay, I I can take a look at it and get back to you. I am not sure how exactly they do it in the baseband. Okay, I'll I can get back to you. Yes. Well, it depends on the um, level of the interferers you can actually handle at the input. Okay, out of band interferers. If your LNA does not give enough, see, remember the uh, LNA can, is has a somewhat narrow band match at the input, but you it, it will be limited. The amount so you you will typically need to knock down signals by like you know 40, 50 dB, maybe higher. LNA will not give you that much. Uh, it will just help things along. Typically, yes, it's not meant to be a filter. That's yeah. The output is the I and the Q. Okay, so let's just name the. The PLL doesn't. Of course you do. What generates uh, sine omega LOT and cos omega LOT is the PLL. We'll look at that. I think uh, 
if you have time, we'll briefly look at the uh, 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 PLL. I think uh, many of the guys have already done it in the analog IC scores. Okay, so we may not get to the PLL. I think uh, I'll probably skip it. We'll get to the oscillator though. Okay, we'll look at we'll also look at ways to generate uh, a sine and cosine. That we can look at in class. Okay, how to generate? How do you generate uh, zero and ninety degrees? We'll look at that in class. Okay, so let's. This is A, and uh, you already know what happens here. So this is B, this is C, and this is D. Okay. So what do you have at A? You have the yes. In phase and quarter components at the base band, going into the base band. How do you? Yes. So what will happen is when this once this goes in, this will go into your base band. It will perform all kinds of uh, you know digital uh, processing, and then finally it will produce the voice signal. Because okay, in a typical system, right? If you take a typical cell phone system, this I and Q will have both voice and data. So typically, you know, uh, modern 3G systems, you can talk and browse at the same time, right? So both voice and data are encoded in the same signal. Okay. So the baseband has to, digital baseband has to separate out those two. Then that goes into the audio PA. Okay. So X of T, that is your received signal. Okay, so that is your received signal. We just use the polar form for now. So it's AFT cos omega LOT plus phi FT. I have written omega LO because omega RF is the same as omega LO. It's a direct conversion receiver. What do you have at B? Uh. Okay, so you have DC and a 2 omega LO component. Okay, so for now, what we'll do is we'll assume that theta is 0. I'll tell you why we have theta there. Okay, so for now, let's just assume theta is 0. Okay, that's what actually we have been assuming so far, anyways. Okay. And at C, assume that after the low pass filter, right? So assume that theta is 0. Similarly, at D, right, you will have minus AFT. Sorry, C is? C before the low pass filter. Sorry, that's a mistake. Okay, it's phi of t. Phi is the uh, sorry, is the uh, phase angle. Yeah, okay, let me. Let me make it obvious. Okay. So how would you demodulate? Actually, you can do it very simply because if you just want to extract the amplitude and the phase, it's actually very simple. So if you look at the signal at C, C and D, if you just do root of C square plus D square, that gives you AFT. Right? Actually, what it gives you is AFT by 2, but yeah, you get the idea. And if you want the angle, then you just have to do
so you need to have the the reason is arctan 2 is the four quadrant tangent you need to know keep track of the signs of c and d okay because otherwise you won't get a unique answer right No, it's tan inverse, right? D over C. So to do that, you'll first okay. So these two things you can do in parallel. If you do sine or cos, you'll need to do it in series. That's all. Okay. So then what you can do is, once you have the baseband signal, you can perform channel selection. Remember you did band selection at up front, you have received the full band, it's come down to the baseband. Now you need to select the particular channel you are operating in. On C and D. Okay. Of course, the other thing you can do is digitize C and D and do the channel selection in digital. You can do that also. Okay. Okay, so what does it look like in the frequency domain? I think we looked at this many times, but uh, we'll just do it once more. So let's say this is your desired signal, and you have some interferers around it. Okay. Okay, at B, we're going to have this. Of course, you're going to have two components. Have this. Okay, so if you're going to do channel selection, you'll do it here on on the desired signal. Okay. So let's look at a couple of other reasons why. Why do we need I and Q? Okay. Obviously, the first reason we looked at is that. You can have independent modulation on I and Q. Okay, so that is the first reason. Yes, it can be either. So one of the ways. Okay, so if you choose polar based systems, then you you can have. Uh, information in the amplitude and the phase, you can split it that way. If you look at linear like QAM, right? I think we looked at QAM if you remember a long time ago. So the, uh, if you look at the uh, the modulation, right? It's called quadrature amplitude modulation. So it, it it looks like this. So obviously these are best represented by an xy xy coordinate rather than r theta, right? So, right. So, so obviously, if the modulation is based on QAM or some some such where you it's easily uh, represented using uh, you know rectangular coordinates, you would use XI and XQ, IQ. Okay, whether it's the transmitter or the receiver, it's a different question how it's produced, but you would use it that way. Okay. Okay. 
okay what is the other reason <laughs> so normally we assume theta is zero okay but in in real cases so what does theta represent so theta represents so we assume that the input angle was cos omega lot okay the lo is cos omega lot plus theta so it represents the phase difference between the local oscillator signal from the pll which you are generating to demodulate the signal to down convert the signal and the phase of the rf signal right in general it is arbitrary right so let's take the example of an am signal in which case phi of t is zero so x of t is just a of t cos omega lot okay what do you have at c and d so you have aft cos theta and aft sin theta by 2 okay at each of these <clears throat> obviously if it so happened that your local lo generated is at 90 degrees from your received signal your i component which is coming out at c will be zero right and if it's exactly in phase the q component will be zero okay so what that means is if you end up just using one channel okay there is a chance that you could get zero output depending on the phase and you can never synchronize really because the the received signal is what you are trying to demodulate right you can never synchronize it perfectly okay 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 then let's consider the case of phase modulation or fm doesn't matter you can't it's arbitrary yes theta varying with input signal it is difficult but because what you are receiving is only the rf signal yes. right how would you you don't know what phase information is there till you down convert it and to down convert you need something which is synchronized which is impossible right it's a you're trying to go around in circles so you can never synchronize the two okay so theta is like how, does it change my like my rf signal changes does theta change sure of course theta is just arbitrary theta depends for example on the path uh, you know it takes in the rf on the rf side okay but if you are finally varying to the square and add and the phase conversion yes doesn't matter, right? it doesn't matter that's right and that's the whole idea i'm trying to explain why you need that square and add okay if you use just the i and q channel yes exactly that's right now the, it's it's a, and it's arbitrary it's inherent and it's arbitrary right you never know so because how how we are able to track that in the once we are locked in once you are locked in the pll then you can try to track it that's right you can try but there will always be some phase error associated between the two okay so let's look at the fm signal <clears throat> yes the input signal we are assuming of a constant which particular frequency then only we can define the phase Okay, so you can assume it's sine, and it will turn out to be the other way. Then, uh, if RF frequency also I know, then I can always find the relation. Means mathematically, I can find what the phase will be. What do you mean? I don't understand. It means uh, whatever RF signal is coming, if I know the phase of that signal. But how do you know the phase of that signal? RF frequency. No, but how do you know the phase of that signal? 
you know the phase when it's being transmitted you don't know the phase when you're receiving it no because uh, uh, that will be extremely difficult right calculate it just based on zero crossing yeah that's going to be extremely difficult because see if it is a pure sinusoid you can do it based on zero crossing if it is in general if it's a modulated signal you can never do it based on zero crossing that's for sure okay you have a cos phi of t at at c a sin phi of t okay suppose you take now that it's only in phase you may think that you can just use one of these let's assume even the theta problem is gone okay what happens let's say let's just take the case of c alone okay remember what you get is this let's say let's just take that as a reference a cos phi of t okay so the real signal could be one of two choices you can never get it uniquely okay and same thing with the sin sin phi of t there are two two portions of the quadrant right but it can have the same sign okay so what are some of the advantages we look at the advantages and disadvantages <coughs> obviously it's very simple okay you don't have this multiple frequencies you don't have I, you know second if and so on so very simple definitely and one big thing which we know we know that heterodyne systems have the image problem right where if your rf is omega lo minus omega if you have an image at omega lo plus omega if right that's a fundamental problem here there is no image because the rf is its own image because if is zero okay what else as you can see we didn't have to use these image reject filters you know some extra stuff right so it's definitely very integrable because it's because it's very simple and you don't need very high quality filters except for no off chip filters except for band select you always need that band select right at the after the antenna okay okay so if you don't need an image reject filter what does this mean so remember that the image reject filter comes between the lna and the mixer right so which means you don't have an insertion loss you don't have the, more importantly the lna does not need to drive 50 ohms that is a big deal because remember lna burns a lot of power trying to drive 50 ohms okay okay and of course you need only a single pll that's a big deal because in the case of the if you have one omega lo and then to demodulate again at the baseband you need a second right omega if okay so all of these look very good it's more sensitive to noise why why is that what kind of noise you mean noise in the pll or noise in the uh, uh, in the rf incoming rf signal because this cycle we have more parasitic so we have this modulation okay so the typical if frequency would be maybe 100 maximum would be like 100 megahertz but it will typically be much lower okay so the lo frequency itself would be around the same between the two approximately the same they won't be very different okay so this rf pll you will always need in the other case you will need a second pll to demodulate again 
at the base band. Okay? Yes. Because the image rejection, okay. So typically the image will be uh, can be maybe 40, 50 dB higher than your received signal. Okay. So if you need to knock it down, you need to knock it down by quite a lot to get your system working properly. Okay. And you can get that kind of performance only with off chip filters. And remember, it also depends on your IF. We saw this before, right? There is an inherent trade off between selectivity and sensitivity. So if you use a if you choose a very high IF, right? You can do, you can filter out the image reject filter is much easier to do. Okay, you can filter it out very well. So your sensitivity is very good because your image falls on top of the signal, and that's very good. But then what happens is, once your IF becomes very large, you do your channel selectivity in your baseband or in your IF, right? In, in the case of a heterodyne, when you do that at higher IFs, if you want to, to knock down the adjacent channels, that becomes tougher. Okay. Yes. Before and after the yes, before and after the LNA. Well, um, no, definitely yes. That is, uh, it definitely helps with that. I would say the number one is the noise figure, but uh, you can integrate part of it into your band select filter. Okay, but if your IF, you know, image falls inside the band, then that's a problem. But apart from that, there, sh there is no particular reason why you can't do that. Okay, uh, except for the noise figure part. Noise figure part is huge. Okay, that is a big, big problem. Um, I can't think off the top of my head. I can't think of anything else. Nonlinearity? Why? No, but your LNA better be quite linear. I don't think uh, at, at, the, at the signal levels we are talking about at the LNA, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, because this, we are talking about microvolts, tens of microvolts. So, amplitude will be amplitude will go into the if there are other signals with amplitudes, mm -hmm. that will be different, like that will reduce the gain of the actual signal, like the gain reduction that happens due to the yes. Now that is possible, that, is, that always happens irrespective of whether you put in the right, if you have adjacent channel, um, that could always happen. Okay. The, the assumption is the band, all the signals in the band, right? Yes, exactly. Because you want to get all of those things down and you do the channel selection at the base band. Okay. Okay, so what are the disadvantages? Large dynamic range for what? For what in the RX? So what? Actually, the what you'll see, we'll, we'll come to that. We are going to see that. You actually, it's a trade-off between dynamic range of the ADC and the uh, analog path, rather than the overall RX. Okay? Most of it, it there is a trade-off involved. The trade-off will be, we'll, we'll come to it. Let's come to it. Okay? Okay, the number one problem, DC offsets. Okay, so if you have any DC offset in your baseband, that is going to add directly with your signal. Okay, so okay. So what happens is, the if you look at the signal coming in through the uh, um, coming in at the output of the mixer, okay, that is what goes into your baseband, right? You have some baseband amplification, and then you have this, um, you have some filtering and so on, okay. So the signal going in that will probably be a few hundred microvolts. So typically, if you see most of the gain, right, comes from the baseband, okay. You have some gain. What do you have in the RF? You have the LNA, you have the mixer. Okay, so the signal coming in is one microvolt. Signal coming in is probably a few hundred microvolts coming out of the mixer. Okay, 
and at that point is where you are adding all the input referred offset of the baseband that will typically be in millivolts or tens of millivolts okay so that is a big problem because your offset is going to be much larger than your signal at that point okay so your rf gain so typically okay what you need is your overall gain from your system will be maybe like 100 db or so okay and so most of the gain will be coming from the baseband your input referred offset could be in tens of millivolts so what does this mean so your dc offset could end up saturating your baseband amplifiers okay saturation means desensitization right we know that we saw this before the next one is yellow self mixing right we saw this before so you can have your yellow leak to your rf port or the input of the lna yes yes the difference is okay if you take the heterodyne architecture okay so your the signal first goes down to if okay at if you don't care about the dc offsets okay but at that point on the if stages you can add more gain okay so instead of being in, you can add another like uh, you know 30 40 db of gain in the if and then you have only 30 40 db of gain in the baseband by that time the signal is only large enough is that clear so what do you have here you again have dc offsets here from your lo leakage and remember that so let me just put the antenna here we talked about re radiation right from the antenna so what can happen is so if you have some kind of re reflection and it comes back and gets received again you can have time varying dc offsets depending on the reflection paths what else can you have <laughs> if you have let's say at the output of the lna if you have large interferers okay those interferers can actually leak into the yellow path so you can have the reverse case you can have leakage from rf to lo of the interferers and then through the mixer again the interferers will mix with themselves to cause dcs that can also happen okay what else ah. so one over f noise is a big problem right because now your signal is at base band does it mean what is the typical isolation number required between lf and lo typical isolation numbers would be 50 db maybe higher maybe lower depending on you know right but not much not very different it will be around 50 db one hour of noise of what of the mixer and your baseband those are the two things which matter the most okay remember in the transmitter we looked at yellow pulling right 
you can have the same thing here. Okay. If you have leakage like this, right, the modulation on the leak uh, on the on the leaked interferer can get passed down to the yellow. That can happen. So it depends on your RF to yellow leakage. Okay, the the other big one. So some of these are, you know, can be showstoppers. Others are an annoyance. But uh, things like yellow pulling may not happen always. Okay, those kind of things may be in specific cases. But obviously, DC offsets, one over F noise, they are all common to all direct conversion systems. Okay. The other thing, even order distortion. Now this is big. Okay. Yes. Well, so if you look at your signal, so let's say your signal looks like this in baseband. Okay. What does a one hour of noise look like? It looks like this. Yeah. So basically, it corrupts all the information in you know a major portion of the signal, low frequency portion, right? Okay. Hello. Okay. So let's see what happens if we have even order distortion in your system. Okay. Let's look at the signals at A, B, and C. So let's say we have an RF signal we want, and we have couple of interferers nearby. Okay. Sorry. What do we have at B? So let's say the LNA has some even order distortion. <coughs> so what happens? Remember B is the output of the LNA. Okay, if it has a second order distortion, these two interferers will produce an omega one minus omega two component, and of course you have your RF. Omega one and omega two. Okay, this is the output of the LNA. And what you'll have here? Let me keep by here. Make this red. Okay. So any even order distortion, especially a second order distortion. Can corrupt your signal mainly because, of course. So the thing is, <clears throat> what we are assuming here is: remember, if this normally goes through the mixer, this would actually get upconverted to some other frequency. But we are assuming that mixer has some limited RF to IF feed through. Okay, so all mixers will have limited. There will be some rejection. So it depends on the even or distortion. The so. What? Okay, we'll we'll come to that. So, what do you? If you have um, even order distortion, you can represent the even order distortion of the system using something called IIP2, right? We looked at IIP3, which is the third order distortion. Similarly, second order distortion can be characterized through IIP2 of the system. Okay. Yes. 
Yes, but then I'm assuming that you have RF to IF feed through. Okay. So let's say now we want to improve your IIP2. How do you improve your IIP2? You want to remove it, yeah, exactly. So the number one thing you so you want to remove your second order, fourth order, and so on. So the best way to do that is go differential. Okay. Of course, the obvious problem with going differential is power consumption, right? Okay. And even if you go differential, finally your IAPT is, uh, IAP2 is going to be limited by your matching. Okay. Matching between the differential paths. Okay. Then the other disadvantage you can have IQ mismatches. So remember we are relying on the sine and cosine of the LO and the matching between the I and Q paths to produce a, a half A of T cos, cos phi of T and minus half AFT sine phi of t okay, at the baseband. Obviously, if you have mismatches in the gain on the two parts or if you have mismatches in the phase going into your mixer sine and cosine, then that will corrupt your signal and in the end it will affect your better rate. Okay? It should be zero signal. Should be? Should be anywhere irrespective of what? As long as you have I and Q, yes. you need to ensure that both are Absolutely. That's right. That will include you can have uh, IQ, you can have corruption due to both. Phase imbalance will come in from the yellow path, amplitude imbalance will come in from the gain in the RF path. Okay. Okay. Channel selection. How do you do channel selection? So you have three options, right? So now you have the I and the Q signal. So you want to get some gain, definitely. Okay. So you want to do some filtering. Okay. And in the end, you want to digitize it. So this is one option. Okay. The other option, so this is A, do your filtering first, do your amplification, there are I mean obviously different uh, trade offs associated with each. Okay. Third option, amplify Okay. and do the channel selection in digital domain. Okay. As far as filtering itself goes, obviously C is the easiest because you can get very, very sharp filters, very good filtering in the digital domain. Okay. But what that means is what is coming in into the ADC is actually your the desired channel plus a bunch of other stuff which are other channels, adjacent channels which can be much larger than your desired channel. Okay. So that means that your ADC needs to be have a very good dynamic range. Right, it needs to resolve your signal in the presence of large interferers. So that is a trade-off in C. If you go to A and B, the ADC is a lot simpler. Right, the dynamic range is only moderate, a few bits, like four to between four to five bits, maybe eight bits. Worst case is good enough. Okay, 
but then there is a trade-off between the filtering and the amplification. Okay, obviously if you have the filter up front, it adds noise, definitely because it has a loss, so that's a problem. But once you cut down the interferers, your amplifier can be non-linear, and you won't see it. You won't see a problem with that. If you do it this way, the amplifier needs to be very low noise, and it has to be very linear. Okay, each one has its own trade-offs and its own problems. You are pushing the problem to one of the blocks, one or more of the blocks in each case. You can do that. Yeah, you can always split the filter between. Yeah, but the thing is, remember we are talking about spacings of maybe a few hundred kilohertz to a few megahertz, and you need to knock down these interferers by 40-50 dB. That is going to be very difficult with an analog filter. Okay. If you want to do, if you want to get, uh, knock it down by this, uh, you know, adequate amount, the filter has to be really, really good. That is definitely a problem. Okay. It can be an AGC amplifier. It, will, it most probably will be an AGC. Okay. Um, as in a VGA, not an AGC. It will be a variable gain amplifier. Okay. The gain itself, so the AGC comes in from the overall system. It won't come in from the on the analog path. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, how do you solve these problems? Let's look at DC offset. Obviously, the far easiest way to do it is avoid, uh, you know, um, transmitting any information in and around DC. That is obviously the easiest way out, right? That you can do, you know, you can uh, employ some kind of DC free coding. You can do that. But in many cases, you do not have a choice. Okay? So, then what can you do? So, you can, you can try to get as close to DC as possible and do some kind of high pass filtering. Okay? which means AC coupling. Okay. Now obviously, the lower you want to cut off, go cut off, right, which means you can transmit more information in the signal itself. The lower you go, the larger the capacitor. The larger the capacitor, you have settling time problems, so that is a big deal, right. So what you can try to do is you can yeah so it will you, you need to go really really low if you want to do this okay your, so your capacitors will become huge that is another problem. So heat and problem will come only if you talk about large signal. Will only come? Only if you talk about large signal. Like large signal at the bottom end of the No because every time you are receiving right you need to set up the DCs on both sides that itself will take a long time. Yeah of course. Yes, biasing has to change. So whenever that happens, there will be a long settling time. For small signal, small signal, it won't be a problem. Okay, you'll have huge caps. So that is. But in reality, what you'll have to do is do some kind of some kind of DC offset correction, either in the baseband or otherwise. Okay, so that is definitely. That is the best way out of it. And now that you have, you know, a very powerful digital, you can do all kinds of things. Okay, you can do it periodically. There are many, many techniques. Okay. So yes. So it will be part of the calibration because typically your DC offset will be constant. Okay, it won't vary with time. At least the component from your circuit due to mismatches will not vary with time. Okay. So that you can use calibration. You can use analog techniques also, definitely. Okay. Flicker noise. Actually, before that, so obviously, if you want to do this kind of DC free coding, right? It is useful for wideband signals. So, if you have um, if you have signal content only in let us say a few kilohertz, 
doing DC free co coding will cause a much larger loss of data, data rate than if you have a already like a, you know, several hundred kilohertz or megahertz. So if you have, let's say you want to cut off, uh, you know, in and around DC, let's say a couple of kilohertz. If your signal, you know, whole signal bandwidth is 10 kilohertz, it's a big, big deal, right? You're losing a lot of uh, data rate. So signal bandwidth is a few hundred kilohertz, you don't care too much. So that's an obvious uh, trade-off, okay? Flicker noise, of course, the only way to do it is increase the size of the signal, right? Sorry, increase the size of the devices, right? Increase device sizes. But obviously, the problem with this is the minute you increase device sizes, you'll need to burn more power to drive these devices. For example, if you increase the size of the mixer, you'll need to burn more power in the VCO path. Okay? Okay? <laughs> what else can you do? If you have the choice, use bipolar. Okay? Bipolar transistors have lower flicker noise. But in this class, since we are concentrating on CMOS, we don't have a choice. But you can just remember that if you have, for example, like a bi CMOS process, or you have access to both, you can try to design some of the circuits in bipolar. That will definitely help. Okay. Sir, yes. No, in this case, the input is at RF, right? We notice that flicker noise comes mainly from the mixer and the baseband, right? Which one? To help with uh, flicker noise? You can do, yeah, sure, that is, you can do that in the baseband. You can always do that. It's uh, same thing. That's right. Okay, let's look at linearity. So, the main thing you want to improve is IIP2. And we already looked at this, right? Design differential circuits is the most obvious thing you can do. But be careful about symmetry. Okay. Then one last thing to be careful about is in your gain path. Remember, most of your gain in the case of the heterodyne, you can split the gain between your RF and IF. In this case, you only have RF and baseband. Okay? So a major portion of the gain has to come. So there you have three places, RF, IF and baseband. Here it's just RF and baseband. So you will have a significant portion of the gain coming from the RF side. Okay? So what you have to be careful about are parasitic paths. Okay, because the minute you have large gain, if you have parasitic feedback paths, you can have stability problems. Okay. Okay. Yes. Because the more gain you have, it's already, uh, you know, yes, the loop gain will become larger. Okay. Okay. So, we'll stop here and continue tomorrow. I think, so we are done with uh, uh, direct conversion systems. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? So we move on to um, heterodyne systems and image reject receivers tomorrow. Heterodyne, we have already looked at it, you know, most of the basic trade-offs in previously. We will just quickly go through it and then go on to the motiv motivation for image uh, IR receivers. Okay?